of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. When I was down, you brought me out. You set my feet on higher ground. Here I stand, you are my God, your faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks, I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing, Lord, I am grateful. I give thanks for all you have done. child of God. Amen. Why don't we share one battle that God has won with a neighbor as we go into this next song. Let's share one battle we can think of. I'm sure we can think of many yeah, that the Lord has won on our behalf. Reconciled 
and pardon from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure a saint's and angel song. Thank you for your love, unconditional. When years of time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when he refused to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, so rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall. Yeah. 
is my home I can't wait for that day When I'll see you face to face For I was made to magnify my maker Yes, I was saved to walk beside my Savior I'm created to worship my so that our faculties, our minds, our imaginations, our thoughts would no longer be instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but now instruments of righteousness to God. Thank you. Thank you, God, for your creation. Thank you for your plan of redemption. And thank you for redeeming all things. We can trust you. You're our God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. Bless and guide us and direct this service in the holy name of Jesus, the awesome name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace toward us today and ask you to lead us in this service and through the day. We are planted, we have been planted, minister to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. Would you turn just for an introduction to Jeremiah chapter 17. Two small points I want to put in your mind uh, from the scripture this morning. Yeah, the first one is that, that you are planted. And so we have chapter 17, verses 5 to 8, are very fundamental in our understanding of our new life. You are born again. Pastor Mark Minicello, who led us this morning uh, in the singing, his mom had a face-to-face -face service yesterday uh, at a church in Harford County, and he shared uh, such a good word, and his brother Vinny was a beautiful uh, event. And one of the points made was that his these are my words, but his mother was planted, planted, so um, in her life she was rooted and grounded, but planted. In the parable here, in chapter 17, verse 5, we see that the prophet is speaking about the heart. 
and the heart can trust in the flesh. So trusting in man in verse 5. Thus say the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. So we have a, a man trusting not in God, but in his own heart, in his own way, his own mind. In a way, Jesus, who was raised from the dead, and his disciples scattered, gathered, then, then we're working on the whole thing. Was he raised from the dead or not? And they had had reports. Um, um, then eventually in time he met them. But remember Thomas had, wasn't in the meeting, wasn't met by the Lord, and he said, I don't believe it. So it, this is a picture of the heart, the heart and how we can easily live and, and go in error. We can live in error. Our Easter play was about two disciples who were walking to Emmaus, and they didn't really believe it. They didn't believe it, and they're talking back and forth. So we have our heart is prone to error, and our hearts can easily depart from the Lord and depart from the truth. Verse 6 For he shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes. So, this uh, heath in the desert is like a scrub plant, uh, shrub. Uh, there are different commentaries on it describing what it is. It's um, not a valuable plant. It's um, not bearing fruit. It's dry, not use, use for much. It's a heath in the desert and shall not see good when it comes, speaking of the human heart. Like good comes, but I can't see it. Resurrection has happened, but I don't believe it. Um, Mary is very excited about it, but I doubt it. Uh, so, so we can be this way. Look at verse 5. Uh, inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land, not inhabited. Now he changes, verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters. I'm going to make a big, big point about this word, planted. How, how can you be planted? You can't do it yourself. Does a tree plant? Can a tree plant another tree? Can, can it just happen? Weeds happen, like the scrub in the desert happens. You just happen. Just live your life. And that's what will happen to you and me. But if Jesus Christ plants you, if you are planted, that's different. You are planted. Somebody had to do it. You know, somebody had to plant you. Somebody had to save you. Somebody had to speak to you. Somebody had to put your name in the book of life. Somebody had to forgive you of your sin. Somebody had to put the Holy Spirit in you. You had to be planted. You couldn't do it yourself. And by the way, we can't do it with each other, with our teenagers or with our family or with our church. It has to be the planting of the Lord where God roots you and plants you. So here's an example. Thomas says, I don't believe, not unless I put my hands in his side. And Jesus is saying, okay. So eight days later, he meets Thomas in John chapter 20. Why? Because Jesus is going to plant Thomas. He's planting him. Yeah, Thomas needs help. 
Thomas needs a ministry. Thomas needs not the world. The world won't plant you. God will plant you. Christ will plant you. Christ will speak to you from things that are from God that t touch your heart and burn in your heart and help you understand. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus um, remember what they said. They said, did not our hearts burn, burn within us? The heart's burning. What's that? Planting. He planted you by the river of water. What is it when, when, you, when you start believing it, embracing it, relating to it? It has authority. And, and, but if you trust in your flesh, or we trust in what the world is saying, or we trust in ourselves, we trust in people, rather than a, a surrender and a trust, if we trust in the Lord, then we will be like a tree planted, and you'll be rooted and grounded, and that will drive out the enemy. You might say, how do I have victory over my enemy? You are being planted. You are being cared for. You are being pruned. You are being guided. You are being ministered to. You are being helped. And that drives out uh, the unbelief. And it drives out the uh, enemy. So that is our lesson for today. Amen. Good morning. Um, these are our announcements this morning. Um, next Sunday evening is Family Life Night. Say that with me. Family Life Night. Okay. Come and enjoy a service dedicated to helping our families. Bring your kids. There will be something for all. Okay. All. All of us. Okay. Um, and... Um, so it's amazing. Uh, what we want to do right now, if this is your first time at a Greater Grace service, uh, we just want to welcome you. If you don't mind raising your hand so we can acknowledge you, welcome, ma'am. Wow, it's great having you here. Anyone else? Uh, Any? Okay. Our ushers have a visitor packet for you. Please receive it, um, and it lets you know who we are. And there's a portion in there where you can let us a little bit about who you are so we can connect as far as a church, all right? Um, this is the first uh, Sunday of the month, and uh, we're going to have communion. And um, so as the ushers get ready uh, to hand out the elements, um, let's just take a moment and just uh, quiet our hearts. Um, go before the Lord and just pour out anything that's there so that we can have communion and be conscious of him and not conscious of ourselves. All right.
was just uh, looking at the body of Christ and, um, you know, the thing I was thinking about when I saw the body of Christ is joy. And you're like, what do you mean? Because of what Christ has done in our lives. Um, we have amazing, we have, we are members one of another. I know sometimes we don't think about that, but whenever we come to church, we realize two things. One, God is for us. Two, we're not alone. We're not alone in this world. And I was thinking of this verse. Um, it's amazing. Pastor Belly spoke a great message in, in class Friday night. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, And when it came to pass, speaking of Christ, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And I was thinking of this word, dogged. Like you could not sway Christ from his purpose, from his plan. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. In Philippians 2, he put on flesh and blood. And when the time came, when the rubber met the road, he set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. When the time came on the cross and they said, come down and we'll believe you, set, established, fixed, unmovable, not wavering, not changing his mind, even when our sins were on his body, fixed. That's amazing. Because as pastor said, we could never do it. We would be wavering. We would, we would bail out. We would become fickle. We would change our minds. But our Savior was fixed. To go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross, the Father plan was fixed. Raise him from the dead. The Holy Spirit fixed in dwelling us. So as we think this morning of communion and the amazing reality of what has been done for us, his body was broken, not wavering, fixed. So with that, let's take and eat the bread. as we think of the blood he is seated at the right hand of the father his blood speaks redemption restoration forgiveness accepted in the beloved one new man fixed amazing so let's take and let's drink Father, thank you this morning for the reality of the finished work. Our sins are paid in full. Your blood is shed and is sprinkled on the mercy seat and we can come boldly. We can rejoice. We can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. We can have a hope that goes beyond the grave all because you were fixed. You were fixed. Thank you for the reality of what we have. Though we in this life at times may be wavering, you are fixed. So we thank you. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If you can take your cups and please pass to the center aisle. Good morning. As we prepare our hearts to take the offering, 
was thinking that much of Christianity today talks about giving, and it comes with a condition. If you give, you will be blessed. But we have a deeper understanding, I think, and that understanding is this. We have been blessed, and we give. I think that's, that's what the finished work, understanding in our hearts, does for us. Um, I, I, maybe over the years you've heard about ministries that have gone to Jerusalem, and they have dipped cloths in the Jordan River, and then they will send you one of those cloths that smell just like the Jordan River if you send in a certain amount of money. Lots of gimmicks, lots of ways, and then all of the promises attached to that giving, you will, be, you will get that car that you have been praying for. You will get that new house that you've been asking for. Pastor Cooper's back there going, yeah, I knew it was going to happen. That's false teaching, my friend. <laughs> the fact is, we have been blessed. We are already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and that's why we give. And, and what's amazing is that, you know how we can give? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. I mean, when you think of some people giving, it's almost like, you know, they're getting a root canal. <laughs> There's so much pain and heartache involved in the process. Do I really have to part with my money? But, you know, when, we, when you understand how much God has blessed you, it's like, thank you, of course. What a, what a privilege to be able to give. When I think of how blessed we are because of your grace, it, that's why they call it grace giving. Amen. Father, we ask you to bless our offering this morning, and we give from hearts that have been won by your grace. And we are so thankful this morning. And may that gratitude be reflecting, reflected in our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Looked to heaven and tried his best. 
broken and bruised in cruel shame stained the cross of Calvary so that men might be saved Satan stand all right now go to someone that you don't know and tell them happy Easter Okay, two uh, points. I think we have um, 1 Corinthians 2. I'd like you to turn there with me for a sub-point. 1 Corinthians 2. I think I have a flower and a bee on a picture. I think there's a picture of a flower and a bee. Okay, that's pretty cool. You've seen that before, sure. 
All right. Turn to, I have you in 1 Corinthians 2, but John 14, no, 16. Okay. John 16, verse 13 and 14 and 15. <clears throat> Albeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. This is the Holy Spirit. And in our picture there of the flower and the bee, I want you to think of the, the, the bee... There's two ways you could think of as an illustration that the nectar in the flower, the nectar inside, you can't get it. You can't pull it out, but the bee can. And in a, in a similar way, there is God, and we cannot get from God what we really need. So we have Christ. Christ came into the world to show us the heart of God, the nature of God. And then he said, I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will show you. He will bring into, he will pull, he will take from God, we will see that in a minute, that the Holy Spirit is in that, in the Trinity, that's where the good stuff is. That's where reality is in God. The reality of God, that's what we are missing. That's what we need in our life. We, without it, we are very prone. We are like the scrub in the desert on our own. We are afraid. We worry. We live in unbelief. We cannot forgive easily. Maybe not at all. We are very judgmental, self-righteous. But this text, look at chapter 16, verse um, 14. He shall glorify me, the Holy Spirit will glorify me, for he will receive of mine and shall show it unto you. By the way, in our meeting here, the only one that is being glorified is, is the, when the Holy Spirit is here, he's glorifying the Son of God. He is glorifying God. We are worshiping God. We, our eyes are on God. And God has got, the Spirit is pulling from inside the flower, so to speak. He's taking from the heart of God and showing us God. Look at chapter 16, verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Everything in that flower is mine. Everything, that, everything in God, that's mine, the Son says. The Son of God is saying, all that the Father has is mine. And I will show it. Holy Spirit will come and he will show you what is mine he will show it to you, verse um, uh, 14, no, 15. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you, that he shall take of mine. These are three, right? Of all that the Father has, we can say, in the flower is the Father, and from there, Jesus says, it's all mine, and the Holy Spirit will show it to you. He will show you what is mine. That changes your life. That changes your life. That's amazing. That's the reason why we're here. That's the reason why we grow. That's the reason why we are planted. Because there will be a time when maybe you don't believe in the resurrection. Just like with Thomas and the two disciples. I have uh, four things that I want you to see that Jesus did in the, in the message in a few minutes. 
that Jesus, after his resurrection, there are four things that he did to minister to his disciples to help them. Because we need help. We need a ministry. We need Jesus to come and minister to us. We need the Holy Spirit to minister to us so that we would be rooted and grounded in him, in who we are, what we have, the value of it, and the, the mission of it and the message of it. Okay, go now to 1 Corinthians 2. <clears throat> Please, chapter 2, in verse 10. It goes with the flower and the bee illustration. Chapter 2, verse 10, 1 Corinthians. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. I think maybe we should do the verse 9 <clears throat> for the context. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither there has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Another way of saying it is, you can't get at it. It's not in your nature. You can't see it. It's in the flower. And even if you saw it in the flower, you can't get it because you don't know how this whole thing works. You know, you, you don't, it's not natural. It's not, it's our, our sin nature has taken us away. So that has caused a lot of trouble for us as people. Um, let's see. This good news drives out the bad news every time. What bad news? Anything we name. Corrupt Babylon, the unresponsiveness of giant bureaucracies, the taunts of Ishtar's priests, Greedily, greedily sucking the economy dry, the anger we feel when the weak and poor are exploited and oppressed, the despair we experience when we fail in love, the arbitrary policies of Nebuchadnezzar, the diagnosis that a cancer is inoperable, the irrational fanaticism of modern dictatorships. This is these are things that happen in our lives, and, and it's just, uh, it troubles us. It bothers us. But, now look at the text, chapter 2, verse 10. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. That's where you live by the Spirit. That's where your life changes. That's where you find peace from the Spirit. You know, when Jesus was crucified and the disciples ran away and there was so much trouble in their heart and on the outside, you'd wonder what, what's going to happen. But Jesus returns. I mean, three days later, he's appearing and disappearing, he comes and he goes, and it's fascinating to study it and look at it, because this is like what we need. We need the Spirit to show us. We, we need the Spirit to build, uh, build us up and, and to understand uh, what is happening. Look at verse 10. The Spirit searches all things, Yea, the deep things of God. You could say the deep things in the flower. The deep things in there that you can't get, he reveals to you. Remember in the beginning of your Christian life when, you, when the Holy Spirit started to move in your life in such a way that you started to believe. And as you believed, you found blessing. As you believed and obeyed, you found blessing. And when God blesses you, you are blessed. 
listen, blessing isn't based on circumstances. It's based on what's in the flower. That what is in the flower is brought to your heart. That's where your blessing is. It's not based on, you know, is life going well? Yeah, I hope it is. But there's something deeper. If you are blessed, like Joseph in Egypt is in prison and slandered by a woman who said he, he tried to, uh, um, you know, he tried to seduce me. She lied. And he goes to prison. But he's blessed. If you are blessed, you are blessed, whether you're in a prison or not. Whether you have pover pro uh, uh, poverty or uh, this or that, or you a uh, divorced or broken family or broken heart. This is a, this is a mystery with God. And it is um, when you start to obey and believe and the Spirit reveals to you the deep things. Look at verse um, uh, 11. For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? All right, now, this is another message, but I want to put down a word here. Uh, psychology. You know, what do you know about another man? You can have the, the, the soft science of psychology, but do you actually know the man, do you actually know the person? They may be, they may be tricking you. They may be lying to you. They may not, they don't know their own heart, it says in Jeremiah 17. But this is a deeper answer. He says, what, does a man, what, do, what are the things of a man? What is it that you would know about a man? But it is the spirit of the man. What do we mean? The bee in the picture is the, is the Holy Spirit that pulls from out of God the deep things of God and, and communicates to us in the Spirit. And it's in the Spirit where you know God. It's in the Spirit where you know truth. It, do you know when Thomas said, um, no, I don't believe, not unless I put my hands in his side. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, no, I don't believe you guys. I know there, there's ten of you, but uh, I just don't believe you. Okay, so this is like us. But when Jesus met him, there's not a record that Thomas did put his hand in his side. But he met the person. And when you meet the person, the deep part of a man, the spirit of a man, that's where you are living. It's the Spirit showing you He is raised from the dead. I don't want to argue that point too strongly, but use it as an illustration, and I think you can follow it with me. There are things that you know in your heart that comes from God, because the Holy Spirit has been sent into the world so that we would be planted we would be planted by the river of living water. We would be rooted and grounded that Jesus would take care of us, that it would come back to our hearts and back to our minds, and we would become worshipers. Now, here's another interesting point. Somebody said, when somebody you love dies, sometimes you keep their clothes in the closet, you leave their bedroom in the same condition, you mourn for them, you have their like, like artifacts or small things, or f of course there's the photos and the memories of the person. And you have those, those are tools that you have to remember that maybe the clothes or something about their lives that you kind of cherish it. You cherish it. But when the person is alive, you don't need that because you have the person. When the person is alive, you, don't, you know, their clothes come and go. They're in that bedroom, they're in that bad bedroom. It changes. But when they're alive, you don't need that because you've got the person. It's the same way with Jesus. 
Jesus died, and you can study the tomb and relics and the cross and the details, but you don't need them if he's alive. If he's alive, you have him. If he's alive, I don't need the relics. They're not that important to me because I have the person. And the person is still speaking. And the person is still loving. And the person is still ministering. We have him. Read the verse with me. Verse chapter 2, verse 11. What man knows the things of a man? And I could almost weep thinking of these things. Save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. You think you know God? You can't know him without the spirit of God. Yes, you can believe in him, but you can't actually know him. History is filled with that. And heresy is one of those things where her heresy is a departure from the faith. And this happens in um, history where uh, people get ideas from their own hearts and they teach them. And our world is filled with heresies. It'd be like Thomas says, I don't believe. He, I don't believe he was raised. Him. I don't believe what you're saying. I don't believe. Three years later, I don't believe. He, he hasn't changed. And now he's uh, a heretic. He's saying it's not true. He's not raised from the dead. That didn't happen. But, uh, but you can, you, you understand. By nature, we are, we, we are heretics. We are people that depart from the faith. But, the, but Jesus comes to Thomas and changes it. You see? Peter denied the Lord um, and, and went back fishing, and who knows what would have happened to him. Just because Jesus is raised from the dead, the work's not finished. I mean, the work for our salvation is, but the ministry of Jesus is needed the ministry of Jesus is needed today. That we are living in a, in a world with a lot of unbelief and people do not know the deep things of God. They don't know them. Okay, now I think some of you fell asleep on me. Turn to your neighbor and just say, are you awake? Wake. Huh? Okay. Almost finished. Almost finished. Maybe. Now look at we get we get with with Jesus after his <clears throat> resurrection. I think, oh, here it is. Without the Holy Spirit, we are prone to heresy, to error. Number one. We, do, we don't believe in the resurrection. And we have Thomas as an example, resurrection. And we get 1 Corinthians 15. The Corinthians, even, 12 to 19. Paul argues, if Christ is not raised from the dead, we are in our sin. We are of all men most miserable. We are charlatans preaching a lie. If Christ is not raised from the dead, the pagans are correct. There is no resurrection of the dead. If he is not raised from the dead, but Jesus comes and he corrects that. Number two, <clears throat> he teaches us love. He went to Peter in John chapter 21. And he made breakfast for him and the others and loved them, told them to cast the net on the right side. They brought the fish in, and Peter, Jesus said, do you love me? 
the deep things of God, love. We must learn that love. We easily get offended in a family. You have to have forgiveness. Number three is forgiveness. Jesus taught Peter forgiveness and the other disciples. The idea is you betray, you, you denied me, you denied me, you were weak and frail and, and cowardly and you were not bold and confident and you couldn't do it and you denied me, but I'm using you. I forgive you, you are restored, feed my sheep. Jesus comes into the world because that's in the heart of God. But it's not in the heart of man. Man is a judge. Man can't forgive very well. God, he has conditions. God unconditionally forgives. He restores people because he loves them. So forgiveness. If you are married, your marriage will not do very well unless you learn to forgive. If you have friends, great friends, there'll be a day when you have to forgive them. When you have a church, you have to learn to forgive. You have to forgive people because we are all human. We hurt people. We fail people. We aren't, don't do what we should do or we do what we shouldn't do. We are, all of us are like that. If you have a family, your sons and daughters and cousins and uncles, you have to forgive. You might say, no, nah, we're good. We don't, we don't need to forgive. We're always right. We're always doing the right thing, always saying the right thing. And I'd say, wow, that's amazing. God bless you. There'll be a day coming when you'll be offended. You'll be offended, and you can't forgive. You'll be offended, and you'll have a grudge. You have offended, and you'll, you're offended. You'll stop talking to them. You got offended. You cannot forgive them. You got offended, you will you will never forgive them. You got offended, you just shut it down. I don't want to see them ever again. That kind of life, that's the kind of life that many, many people that, and Christian people live that life. And it's wrong. It's not the heart of God. It's not inside the flower. Inside the flower is something that you don't know about. And it's called forgiveness. And it's called love. And it's called the resurrection, too. And the fourth thing that Jesus um, taught them after the resurrection, and there were many, many of them, uh, um, is faith. The way you know me is to live by faith. Has the Spirit taught you to live by faith? Has the Spirit taught you to continue in your life by faith? Has the Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> has the Spirit brought the verses to your mind? For without faith it's impossible to please Him. For they that come to God must believe He is and a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Yes, I think He does teach us that. To live by faith. Why, why do you go to church so much? I go by faith. Why do you say your prayers? Because of faith. Why, do you, why are you forgiving your enemies? By faith. How is it you're reading the, the word and, and understanding it? It's by a life of faith. How do, how do you uh, share your faith with other people? By faith. Many things we do by faith. How do you give money to the poor? By faith. Well, you'll never see it again. Yeah, I loan it to the Lord, the proverb says. The Lord will do it. How about Joseph in Egypt when he was in Egypt and um, his brothers had caused the trouble and the woman had caused the trouble. and He's in the prison and he has to forgive his brothers in his heart. And in faith he does. And then there's a dream in the dream from the butler and the baker. And, the, and Joseph says, God told me what that dream is about. And he told the baker. 
And the butler, basically, Baker, you're going to die. And butler, you're going to go free. And he said to the butler, when you get out, remember me. And the scripture says, the butler got out and he forgot about him. Whoa. <laughs> what it, the Bible should say. And he remembered him, but it doesn't say that. He forgot about him. You know, the life of faith, this is fantastic. It's not known. When, but Jesus is the minister. Jesus is the one that cares. He is the one that instructs us. He is the one that taught us the parables. He is the one that leads us. He's the one that tells the disciples, follow me, I will make you a fisher of men. I will do it. How about this one? I will bless you. And if you are blessed, you are blessed. In blessing, I will bless you. Now, Jacob had a son. He had the sons who slew the people in the village. And Jacob said to his sons, he, do you remember, because didn't one of them rape Diana? And then the sons wanted revenge, so they went and slaughtered the people. He had them circumcised, right? And then when they were... Yeah, they were slaughtered, and Jacob said, you're going to make us smell in this country. We're going to get slaughtered because of you guys. They're going to have revenge that the people in the area, they're going to have revenge on our family. We're going to be slaughtered. But it didn't happen. Why? Because they're blessed. If you're blessed, like Joseph in Egypt, if Jacob is blessed, then he's blessed. These are deep things. And these disciples, they don't know much. They don't know how to forgive. They don't know how to love. They don't know how to believe. They don't believe in the resurrection. These are the ones that are planted. These are the ones that God has called and put there. And they're the ones that he's taking care of and he's teaching them deep things. Then they write the epistles and we read, they, they write the, the scriptures and we, we understand that this is like us, that we have received something that's from God into our hearts. And if you are blessed, now watch. What, what about this? Somebody steals from you a lot of money, $100,000. Somebody steals from you your money, a lot of money. And I go to the court or I try to get justice and I struggle with it and maybe I don't get the justice. And the thief has succeeded. I'm offended. I want revenge. Of course, I want justice. We all want justice, but sometimes we don't get it. I must, for, I must learn. I must learn deep things, things that are not natural, things that are spiritual. I must learn about blessing. I must learn about faith. I must learn about prayer. I, by the way, some of you, you need to learn about sharing your faith, opening your mouth. You must learn about sharing with people and drawing them to faith, helping them talk about God, helping them learn about forgiveness, helping them learn about the world that we live in, but from a deeper point of view, because it's very much needed. Because people are suffering and they're very afraid. I have a paragraph here and I'll finish with this. And it's um, um, something about people being afraid. Yeah, they got it. The age is evil. That's First Peter chapter 1. The evil, evil world. We fear nuclear holocaust, overpopulation, 
destruction of the ozone layer, starvation in the third world, double-digit inflation, personal fears of rejection, failure, insignificance, and ill health. Fear is a normal response to the chaos around us, the threat of being overcome by hostile forces or being ineffective or hurt or thwarted or fated to poor and mean and scrubby lives. I like that phrase. I'm afraid of living a mean and poor and scrubby life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is so true. I am afraid of that. I don't want to live like that kind of life. But, but, but actually, I have lived in those places with those people. But I have, I have found, you and I, and I'm, it's us. I hope you understand that. Yes. But when Jesus is alive, and he's showing you things, and he's loving you, and you are loving people. You are loving people in a cave, in the cave of Adullam. You're loving people in the third world. You're loving people in a ghetto. You're loving people in a, in a school where, you know, it's just so sour and so dark. But you, you have, because the deep things of God have gone to the deep part of you. And so you have a ministry. Thomas, what happened to you? I got it. He's alive, I know. Peter, what happened to you? I've been forgiven. I mean, it's clean. It's like not even in my mind. And by the way, when he writes his two epistles, he doesn't even mention it. It's not even in his, it's not in his uh, message. Isn't that amazing? Uh, you know, when, when we have found Jesus Christ as a living person in our own hearts, in our lives, and we start living like that, we are planted. We're not a weed that's just popping up somewhere and living a scrubby life. We are planted. We have a message. We have words. We have prayers. We have faith. We have friends. We have love. We have forgiveness. We have each other. We have a Hey, we have eternal life. And it didn't just start, it doesn't start after I die. It starts the day you believe. Christ is in you. And that's why we are unique people. And very much you and I are very much needed in this world. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I pray that we could open our mouths as we ought to and make known the mysteries of Christ in our everyday life. I pray that in our families we would learn to be offended and get through it in Jesus' name, amen. Let me just say one thing about that. You get offended in your family, and you just shut it down. I'm done. I'm done with that family member. I'm done with it. Okay. You are, you are missing an opportunity of growing in a blessing. You are missing something. You have to work through it. You have to forgive, and you forgive again, and you forgive again. You've got to work through that. Don't run away from your family member. You have a good time talking, and you get it, put it, you say, I, I'm, I, listen, I love you, I, I, or you don't talk about it all, you just in your heart you deal with it, but you've got to forgive and work through it. Stay in there. Stay in there. Say, same way in a marriage. You stay in there. You work at it. You stay in it. You keep going. And you forgive, and a lot. You forgive a lot. Forgive a lot. Forgive a lot. It's very important. Okay. Okay. Lord Jesus, lead us to forgive and not be offended. Or when we are offended, we will work through it and stay in it 
and stay in it in love and forgive again and again and stay in it in Jesus name and then if you're not a believer but you you're searching you want Jesus in your life come to him by faith it's by faith you need him and say Lord Jesus Christ save me and he will immediately he forgives you he, he gives you the new birth now turn away from your ways and trust him walk by faith in him and learn repent from your bad stuff put it down knock it knock it off Just change it walk with God and you will discover your great blessing in him in Jesus name amen
has such a good practical message for our lives. Yeah. Yeah. God just takes, pull, extracts out of him and imparts it to us. And then we can impart it practically in our lives, in our relationships, in our families, in our situations and circumstances. Wow. Just let's just raise our hands. Just thank God. Father, thank you so much for that word this morning. Help us, God, to just meditate on what we've heard today. To just turn it over and over and over so that it becomes butter. That it just sticks, sticks in us. And then, Lord, that it just pours out to others. Thank you, Lord. Bless the 11 o'clock service, 6.30 tonight, 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Bless our week, Lord. God, give us times of reflection on your word to taste and see that you are good. Thank you we've been in your house. Cover our day in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.